Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Transplant Recipients International Philadelphia Chapter Edition of this uh, January 2022. Uh, I'm excited to uh, welcome you all back into 2022. I'm glad you all made it. I'm looking for some exciting topics and uh, meetings in 2022. Uh, tonight, we have a real interesting uh, topic, and uh, I am co-host with the national president from Transplant Recipients International Organization, Jim Gleason. Jim, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, and of course, the topic tonight is xenotransplantation. Uh, there's been a lot of talk in the news of uh, the porcine to human. So I thought tonight we'd have a frank discussion. Jim, why don't you uh, lead us off? Did everybody get that? This is a fascinating topic, and I can recall back in 2006, Gift of Life had a panel at the Valley Forge Middle School of students talking about organ donation, and then it opened up to the students for questions. And somebody raised the question about xenotransplantation, and I was the one who picked up on that. And at that time, in 2006, my answer was, there's nothing going on with it. It was not in the news. Hadn't heard anything in a long while about it. And so this has been a dead issue until a couple of things changed in recent years and this week or this past week. And so in contrast to that, we have this famous January 7th pig heart transplant down in Maryland. And then that related also to our good friend, Bob Montgomery, doctor over in heart transplant recipient doctor over in New York City who did a kidney transplant on a deceased body to see if it would work. So there's a lot going on in the background here. And before we get into that topic, let's go around the loop here and get everybody introduced. And I'll save our star guest for the very end of it. Uh, but our first guest is Ira. You're out, of this, you're out of the picture now. There we go. Ira and Glenda. And you'll see they, they connect to one of these stories in just a minute uh, from over Manhattan. Say hello, Ira and Glenda. Hello, everybody. Good evening, nice everyone. To see you. Got Bob Goodman there, heart recipient in Philly. Sue Kelsner, and there's Bob off to the side, living donor and double kidney recipient. Our other guests from Maryland, I had hoped that maybe if there's any new news, what's going on down in Maryland, they would know it. And I have you heard anything down there at all, Marty, Michelle? No, nope. okay. We, no, not we've, yet. We've tried, but. No news is probably good news. If something was going on, we'd certainly hear about it, wouldn't we? Yes. We have Elizabeth, how many years out with that uh, liver? God willing, it will be 30 years in this coming August. Amazing, amazing. And Marty certainly is, is inspired by you as he follows with his own liver recipient. All right, and the foxes. Say hello, foxes, angel. Okay. All right. And then as hello. <laughs> as Bob mentioned down there in Virginia. Uh, there's oh, there's John Scanelli over on the other side. It's different on every screen here. John, say hello from Virginia. Hey, happy New Year, everyone. Thank you. Steve Schaefer. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year to you. And and just by way of information, John, what's your transplant and when? Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Day, 2015. And what organ? Uh, heart. All right. Steve, your organ and year? 2013 kidney. Okay. I'm going back to Marty. Marty, what year did you get your liver? 2009. All right. And Glenda, what's your year? 1999, kidney pancreas. All right. Barry? Yeah, I'm a uh, heart transplant in uh, 2014. Okay, and Susan, kidney pancreas? Um, kidney pancreas in uh, 1998. 1998, good years, those late 90s. Wow. Brian? Yep, I am a double lung transplant recipient, December 23rd and 24th of 2014. So wow. I just celebrated seven years. Very good. And Gary? Yeah. Hello, thanks for having me. What organ did you get and when? Got a heart transplant 
Christmas Day, 2015. They came into my room on Thanksgiving Day, so John maybe was a better candidate for that heart than I was. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad. I'm still glad you got it. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of very thankful people on this call, that's for sure. And, you know, it is so great because we all inspire ourselves with how active and what life is doing with the gift that we receive. So really appreciate that. And so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce another friend of TRIO's, David Carmel, which uh, I ran into a number of years ago with a different company that he was with at the time. And so I'm going to introduce David, not only as a friend of TRIO's, but also by asking him, David, when you left the other company, you went to eGenesis. What is eGenesis and why did you make a leap like that in your career? Well, good question, Jim. And um, good evening, everyone. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Bill, that was quite something with the cheesesteak on the head. I feel like I need to have like lox and bagels or something <laughs> since I'm in New York, but um, it's really great to be with you all. I'm, you know, Jim is a dear friend who I've known for years. I actually went to your national meeting in Kansas City um, a couple of years ago. And yeah, at the time I was at a company called Atara Biotherapeutics that was developing a cellular immunotherapy for post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. So one of the most common forms of cancer that happens after transplant. And Jim and I got connected and um, he had done the post-transplant cancer website and um, that's how I got connected. And then I got recruited away from Atara to join eGenesis two years ago. And we are a xenotransplantation company. Um, started out of, originally the, the technology comes out of Harvard at a George Church's lab. And um, we're genetically altering pigs to make the organs suitable for human transplantation. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm, you know, I am not an organ transplant recipient, but I actually am a tissue transplant recipient, having gotten somebody's femur in, that is now the sixth cervical vertebra in my neck after I broke it in 1999. So um, I'm, I'm always delighted to be in TRIO's company. Anytime that Jim asks me to do something, I try to do it and uh, really happy to be with you tonight. David, I'm glad you accepted our invitation. It was given to him just like a day ago. And so he jumped right at the opportunity. David, I have to ask you, you were very, uh, doing very well with the Terra Bio. And then next thing I know, you move over to eGenesis. And as you just described them, they're into the xenotransplant world. Your focus in that company is more on kidneys, right? Yeah, that's right. So now, now, I'm trying to interpret. You made a change in your career at a key point going into what we would realize is new stuff. You must believe in it. Tell us your, your faith in this. Yeah. So, you know, when I was at Atara Bio, I was in touch with a number of um, organ transplant recipients. I mean, that's how Jim and I got to know each other. And um, I was fascinated by the field. And in particular, Jim and I had a mutual friend named Jessica Malore who had a heart transplant um, when she was 16 years old. She was the captain of her tennis team and she had a sudden heart attack. And she lived with her heart for about 20 years and then um, I got to know her because she had had post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease or PTLD, not just once, but twice and um, beat it both times. And then 20 years after she had her heart transplant, she needed to go on the transplant wait list again for not just a heart, but a kidney. And, um, Unfortunately, she was at Columbia Presbyterian and unfortunately she passed away. So I got to see the need right up front. And uh, while I loved what I was doing at Atara Biotherapeutics and also in the transplant space, in terms, there's just a fundamental problem in organ transplantation, which is there are just not enough organs to go around. And even if we had a opt out system where everybody needed to say that they were out if 
to give a, an organ donation, which I fully support, there will still never be enough organs to go around. And that fundamental problem and seeing stories like Jessica's right up front is really what laid, led me to eugenesis. Um, so yeah, I mean, Jim, I'm happy to give people a little background on xenotransplantation, what would be helpful. Well, I just wanted first for you to, by the fact that you moved to that company, you must believe in the process and, and the future of xenotransplantation. Am I correct? Yes. I mean, you're betting your career on it. Now, I've got to say, uh, our friend David Bennett, with 57-year-old, he bet his life on it, which is a yep. different, different level. But why don't you talk about, it was so quiet in this world of, of xenotransplantation those many years ago. What changed? What made this possible now? Yeah, great. it's a great question, Jim. So it's been the notion of xenotransplantation has been contemplated for over a century. Um, they started doing xenotransplants back in the early 1900s. Um, th actually, they did they did transplants from um, chimpanzees into humans. All of it failed miserably. Um, and really the, the essential problem is how do you get around the molecular mismatch between other species and humans? And um, people quickly realized um, back in the 90s that there was a huge opportunity when Dolly the sheep was cloned. Do you guys remember Dolly the sheep? Um, so this is Ian Wilmot in Scotland who was the first to clone a mammal. And it was a, a sheep named Dolly. And for the first time you could see a future where animals could be cloned. Why is that important? Because if you can make the genetic changes that you need to see to make animals compatible with humans, then you can actually make xenotransplantation possible. So, um, there was a big effort in the 1990s when gene editing had first come into the fore to make xenotransplantation a reality, and they just couldn't overcome the two essential hurdles. The first hurdle is that pigs have, and, and pigs were chosen as the species. Why pigs? Well, pigs have, are unbelievably similar to us. Um, my wife would probably think that that's an apt description since I'm not the neatest person in the world. Um, but, um, but, but their organs are not just a suitable size, but they have incredible homology, similarity to humans. And um, that's something that was recognized. They also have some advantages. Like sheep, they can be easily cloned. Um, and they have large litter sizes. And so if you're going to genetically alter a pig to make the organs suitable for human transplantation, you want there to be a, a plethora of donors because the need is so acute. And you also don't want the gestation times to be very long. So primate, you know, non-human primates are very similar to us, but they, they have long gestation times. Them as donors is just not gonna ever meet the need for um, all of those people who are waiting for an organ. Um, so there's two essential problems um, that had to be overcome with xenotransplantation. The first is that pigs have something, have an endogenous retrovirus. This is a virus that is encoded into their genome. It's in all pig species. It can be up to 70 copies of the retrovirus that are in their genome. And you don't want that in humans. I mean, as we all sit here looking at each other over Zoom, we've spent a lot, way too much time in the last two years looking at each other over Zoom because of what was likely a zoonotic transfer in Wuhan, China, um, between an animal and humans. And so even 
the possibility of this virus jumping from pigs to humans really halted the field in the 90s. My company was formed because George Church used a new tool, which was called CRISPR-Cas9, which is a gene editing tool. You can think of it as a, as a set of molecular scissors. You're able to cut out the things that you don't want, but not to disturb the, the overall genome. And um, he figured out how to use that to eliminate these retroviruses. The second problem is the molecular incompatibility between pigs and humans. And it basically boils down to two things. One is that pigs have these carbohydrates that are at the end of their proteins. Um, I won't go through the scientific names, but there's three major what are called xenoantigens that you have to get rid of. If you tried to transplant a human with just a wild type pig, a pig off of a farm, um, the recipient would die with, with you know, minutes to hours um, because this molecular incompatibility is so strong. So that's the first thing that needs to go. The second is the same problem that all of you have experienced when you got your organs, which is when you have um, dissimilarities between the donor and the recipient, you can have a problem of either acute or chronic rejection of the organ. And that's a problem that also happens in pigs. And the way that people have dealt with us, would dealt with it, including us, is they have put in human regulatory transgenes which modulate the immune response. In other words, you're putting things into these genetically altered pigs so that the human body won't recognize that it's foreign. And, you know, we've been at this now for, my company is uh, about six years old. And um, what happened in the last essentially four months is that there's been four actual Xeno transplants. So they've taken a pig organ and done four transplants. The first two were for brain dead patients. It happened at NYU. Um, Jim mentioned uh, Bob Montgomery, who's one of our clinical advisors, um, did the transplant. And what they were looking for, and so they have knocked out those carbohydrates that I told you about. And the goal was over just the course of three days, um, will there be an immediate rejection? And the answer was no. But interestingly, it wasn't just that the answer was no, but the kidney um, functioned very similar to a human kidney. So it controlled creatinine and bun, which for those who have gotten kidneys, you're very familiar with. It's the two major markers of kidney function. Um, and the organ actually produced the same amount of urine as you would expect a human kidney to do. So very cool, very promising, but it only answers the question, will something bad happen immediately? Um, and Luckily, that answer was no, but it was really the transplant that Jim talked about of Mr. Bennett, who um, was not a candidate for an allo transplant. Um, he had been um, non-compliant in the past with his doctor's orders, and he was, did not qualify for the allo transplant wait list. He was in the hospital. He couldn't get out of bed. He had absolutely zero options in front of him. And so what, um, what the group in Maryland did is they worked with a company called Revivacor to procure a heart for Mr. Bennett. And they transplanted him with this porcine kidney. I mean, sorry, this porcine heart, which very similar to us, had both knocked out the carbohydrates and put in these human transgenes. Um, 
The one thing that they didn't do is to knock out the retrovirus, but they're monitoring him closely for that. And here he is more than two weeks out from the transplant and doing well. We heard actually today from a, one of our collaborators at Mass General um, that he's doing well, that they think he's gonna be in the hospital for about two months, um, but then they hope to discharge him. And that is a, just a remarkable thing. And honestly, I have, to, I have to give the FDA a lot of credit. The, the FDA has something called compassionate use. And so they can authorize a transplant or another um, experimental um, drug for humans if they think that the patient has no other choices. And they, they were brave and they did this and it has really opened people's eyes to the potential of a limitless supply of human compatible organs. I think you're on mute, Jim. When my phone rang, I put myself on mute. Sorry about that. David, one last thing before we take you off the presentation side of this, if you will. Yeah. You and I had a brief discussion and you were talking about uh, the potential that your eugenicist has to get approvals based on the testing you've done in primates. Could you just address that sh shortly? Because I thought it was rather fascinating. Yeah, so um, if you look at all the studies that led to aloe transplant, and in particular, the immunosuppressive drugs, which you all are taking, um, they were done first in non-human primates. And um, the non-human primates that received them, it's a pretty um, challenging model because they remove both of the monkey's kidneys and replace it with a single kidney. For the immunosuppressive drugs, they did an aloe transplant, so monkey to monkey. And for xenotransplant, we are doing pig to monkey. And what's amazing is that the success that we're seeing, and we now have monkeys that are living out well past a year with a single genetically engineered pig kidney is that they're doing well and they are, their creatinine and bun are, are fine and um, they're, they're healthy animals, um, which is really a remarkable thing. Our goal is to get repetitive long-term survival in non-human primates so that we can actually start a human clinical trial. Different from what they did in Maryland where it was just a one-off patient that they gave emergency use authorization for, but to actually run a clinical trial. Um, and if we can do that, then we think we can go and do a phase one study of a limited number of patients, maybe six to 10 patients. And then from there, go into a, what's called a pivotal trial and do it on a larger number of patients. We don't know yet that, what that is, but maybe 50 to 75 patients. Um, and if those go well, then the FDA could potentially approve this for, um, for human use. And this would make it not just something that we could do opportunistically like Mr. Bennett, but actually have them available for all patients in need. Um, so I'll leave it there. I'd love to hear your questions. I've talked a lot. I would you know, love to hear what your thoughts are as organ transplant recipients um, and, and just if you have any questions. Anyway, I really appreciate that introduction at that detail level. And especially it was exciting when I first heard, and again tonight, uh, your success in over a year out in a primate with a kidney transplant from a genetically engineered pig. That's been fascinating. 
Let me take us back to July of 2019. I'm going to turn this over to Bill. Uh, we went into New York City at the invitation of Dr. Montgomery to talk about xenotransplantation and the small world that it is, as we were wandering through, uh, the, the Rainbow Room is in, what is the RC, not RCA building, the whatever big building it was there. Right? Rockefeller Center. Rockefeller really? Center. We run into Glenda and Ira. And that's another set of personal friends. And it was like, oh my God, look at this. Where are you going? We're going up to this dinner. And so I'll turn it over to Bill. Bill, why don't you talk about that very fascinating evening we had over there in New York? Yeah, so you can see in between us, uh, the Empire State Building. Uh, what a fabulous view from up there. Um, so interestingly enough, this is the first time that I had the opportunity of meeting uh, Bob Montgomery. So Dr. Montgomery had uh, recently had his heart transplant. He was in Italy attending an opera when uh, he had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and had an episode and uh, he ended up back in the States. And, you know, as he always preached, you know, hep C heart, it's fine, do it. So he accepted a hep C heart. So we got to talking and uh, the, the furthering of that story is that I got to meet his brother, Larry Montgomery, uh, when I first started having heart issues and my hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was diagnosed was back in 1999. I was at Temple University Hospital, and that's where heart transplants were done in Philly. Uh, so I was on the same floor as all these heart uh, patients that were awaiting uh, a heart transplant. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, I think it was the bulletin at the time was actually following 25 patients in Philadelphia through their journeys of waiting for a heart. And this was when I was getting my first defibrillator implant. And I said, hey, wait a second, I need to talk to somebody. And lo and behold, they lined me up with Larry Montgomery, who was a dentist at the time in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. And uh, we had similar histories with this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He lost a brother to it. I lost a brother to it. So there was a lot of connection with this. Uh, so I got to tell the story of, hey, you know, I know your brother. And at that time, it was time for him to take his meds before we went into this dinner. And he dumped out his immunosuppressant meds. And I'm like, hey, wait a second. I don't recognize any of those. He's like, yeah, well, I'm actually switching over um, to this new medication. And I forget which one in particular, but he said, you know, this will minimize my tremors. So I will still be able to operate. So it was just a really neat that we were sharing some stories and I was getting a glimpse into things. And then of course, uh, cocktail and the reception hour was over. And then we moved into the rainbow room for dinner where Dr. Montgomery talked about, you know, the whole thing with, uh, porcine and kidneys into pigs. And this was a day that something big was happening down in uh, DC. Uh, Cause I know a lot of um, people were coming up from DC on the train uh, to New York city. And uh, Jim, what, what did we determine that was? That was the big white house conference with a focus on organ donation. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, some of the people got on the train, came up to this dinner and remember what was the topic of the dinner? It was a patient panel around the dinner. There was some medical professionals observing, but really it was a question they put to us. Do you remember what it was, Bill? Um, well, it was basically, hey, would you accept a kidney from a pig, right? Or an organ from a pig? Because what, what would it take for a patient to accept an animal's yeah. organ? Yeah. And so what, what are your recollections from that dinner, Bill? And then we'll turn to Ira and see what he and Glenda remember too. Yeah, well, the whole discussion was uh, obviously, as you said, what would it take? And, you know, people were talking about, hey, you know, this is where you start, right? Because there is dialysis. If this didn't work, they could easily go on dialysis, where if you were testing a heart or a liver, uh, you don't have a game plan B, right? So everything with experimental stuff, as we know, with hep C organs and so forth, they all really start with uh, the kidney, right? So it was basically focused on that, although there were some heart recipients there talking in terms of, of hey, would we accept uh, a heart? 
And do you remember what the consensus was or what the, the popular answers were? If not, I'm sure Ira and Glenda may remember. I do. I've got my answers, but we all <laughs> probably have different uh, perspectives on what we heard. Yeah, well, there. everybody was just like, yeah, why wouldn't we, right? Well, there was more to it than that, as I recall. Ira, what do you remember? What was the consensus or, or Glenda even? Uh, what, what do you remember as being the answer to the question, what would it take? I remember there was one person there who said, give it to me, I'm ready. But I said, if it's my only option, then I'm fine. And that, that certainly was key. Ira, do you remember anything else? Yeah, do you remember? Yeah, I, I think uh, um, first Dr. Montgomery and his colleague from California who were kind of getting some banter started and going back and forth wanted to kind of up the ante a little and, you know, make us think about the, what, what he called, as I remember, he called it the ick factor. I oh, mean, are you going to, uh, are you going to wear a t-shirt and go out in public? Would you be a person who would go out in public wearing a t-shirt saying, I have a pig's kidney, you know, and, and what are the, the, the moral um, and ethical, and there were some fairly good, serious moral and ethical issues. But I do remember Jim mostly what what Glenda, how Glenda remembered it, because um, uh, I think that's the the kind of thing we both had, which was yes, I think it, if that's the choice that I'm going to be confronted with, then of course I would take it. I have no problem discounting any ick factor whatsoever. And I, it seems to me that Mr. Bennett is the perfect example of, of that. He was confronted with absolutely no choice. I mean, he had no choice going forward. So right. of course he said, bring it up. That, that I recall was the major answer, but there was another very important one I, I recall. And that was, yeah. if you trusted your surgeon and he said you should do it, that became a major factor in getting the confidence to say yes. And, and so, David, um, I'd be curious, certainly at eGenesis, you must be thinking about this. Have you done any research on what it would take to get people to accept the product you're creating? Yeah, we, we have, in fact. And um, really for kidney transplant, which is where we've done the most research, it's, it's one year of... Um, of the graft lasting is really the threshold that most patients say is, you know, what it, what it would take. If they could get off dialysis for a year, um, it would be worth it. And so that's the bogey that we're shooting for. We think we can go much longer than that. Um, you know, if the, if the studies that we're doing in non-human primates pan out, um, you know, we think pigs tend to, la tend to live 20 to 25 years. We think that the organs could last just as long. So um, one year is the minimum that I think people would want to accept and that I think payers would want to pay for. Um, but um, we think it can be much longer than that. Interesting. The, the other big, big question out there and I was just reading an article uh, this evening that says, while hailed at a medical breakthrough, we're talking about the pig transplant heart, the procedure also raised ethical questions, particularly among some Jews and Muslims who consider pigs to be unclean and avoid pork products. So let me throw this out to the group here, because there are several people here who are of Jewish background. And what in that religion, I, we don't have any Muslims that I know of here, uh, would be the religious position on that. I know organ donation is a higher level of mitzvah and therefore it overrides some of the whole body issues in the Jewish religion. But when you get down to the idea of a pig, is that an issue? Uh, uh, Elizabeth, you, you've got a smile on your face. You got any insights to that? I think it would depend on how observant uh, the Jew was. Um, you know, like I eat ham and I'm Jewish. So it wouldn't be a problem for me, but it would be a problem for the Orthodox and Hasidic Jews, I'm sure. 
I don't know if it would be a problem for the Orthodox Jews because it's talking about your health and saving your life. Right. And that supersedes yeah. Yeah. Uh, the laws of Kashrut. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, there that, there is I... one, one concept, Jewish concept, which, which really kind of says, if this, this, the thing you have to do falls under this category, sure. then all bets are off. And it's called to save a life. Uh, we as, as right. Jews know it as pikuach nefesh. Right. And um, I think that the rabbis, um, even the, the orthodox ones, and I can certainly see Robbie Berman running over to Israel and getting consensus here, they would say, um, you know, there um, we accept organs. We don't know when we accept an organ, what that person might have eaten before they were a donor. You know, they were they were black, they were white, they were Muslim, they were whatever it was. Um, they lived on a pig farm, but they offered up this gift of life. And we as as Jews are grateful that someone stepped forward to give us this gift of life. I, I would bet there's, uh, and I'd be, it's a great question to ask somebody like Art Kaplan. I'd love to get him on the phone and ask him. They always turn but, to him, don't they? Yeah, but, but it's a great question. But I think you would find very little moral and ethical objection to it. I, I, I honestly think that's true. Yeah, something else we need to keep in mind is that uh, pig heart valves have been used for many, many years. Absolutely right. And I'm sorry, Brian, that's right. You know, there hasn't been an objection to that in the Jewish community, to my knowledge. No. Barry, what do you have to say about things? You have your hand up. Yeah, um, I might have missed it, but question for David. Uh, with the altering of the uh, pig organs, um, is it the same uh, immunosuppressive drugs or there's no need for drugs? Is it going to be at that, that level where, you know, if someone, ex if the choice between a human heart and a pig heart, and if your life is less complicated being on the immunosuppressive drugs and maybe even remain healthier, you know, not susceptible to a COVID or, or something else, be a high risk, maybe that would affect someone's decision to, to, you know, if they had a choice between the two. So I didn't know if you addressed, if they had to take immunodrugs uh, as part of this process. Yeah, that, that's a very astute um, question, Gary. So um, initially in humans, you have to go in with standard of care to do just drop, oh, there you are. Um, you, so they will be on standard immunosuppression. And in fact, we also use an experimental um, immunosuppressive drug, which is, has been shown to be particularly useful in xenotransplant, um, which the FDA would be fine if we take through our preclinical studies to, to use in humans. Um, ultimately, the goal with xenotransplantation is you can make the edits good enough so that you can obviate the need for immunosuppression and either reduce it or eliminate it completely. And um, that, that is really the goal because, I mean, you all know better than I do, you know, the, the side effects of immunosuppressive drugs. Um, they've gotten better, a little bit better over time, but there's still, you know, major side effects. Boy, would that be a deal breaker in terms of that positive way of getting people to accept that. If you had, along with the choice in terms of uh, desperate life, uh, no issues with religion, and, uh, you know, you get over the ick factor, as you call it, to the point where there was a side benefit of you wouldn't need immune suppressant drugs. Wow. Talk about uh, a way of encouragement. Yeah. Anything else have any, any comments on that, uh, that issue? Barry? Barry, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I had seen some videos that uh, must have been about 10 years or so ago. There's, a, I think, a researcher in Michigan where they would take a pig's, I think it was a pig's heart. They would denature the pig's heart and then take the patient's stem cell 
and uh, allow the stem cell to grow in this sort of uh, 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 structure that was from the pig. And uh, the stem cells would turn into heart tissue and start to beat. And there, and so you were actually, you were transplanting or a, uh, the patient's heart that uh, came from its own stem cells, which meant you wouldn't, there'd be no need for, for uh, immunosuppression. So I, I don't know if D David was, has heard about that or if that's is something that, that uh, has, has been pursued uh, uh, further. David, yeah, before no, they, you get into that, David, we did have a speaker, and, and I think it goes back at least 10 years ago, who talked about that using the scaffolding of an existing organ and putting the, yes, yeah. you know, the recipient cells on it and growing it. And they were doing it with bladders. And they had many, especially young people who they did, did it with there. I, I really should find, I don't remember, I didn't have notes then of uh, finding that speaker to come back and say, you know, 10 years later, where is that technology today? But David, go ahead. Yeah, no, you're exactly right, Jim. And, and um, thanks, Barry, for the question. So, um, so yes, they, they, maybe it was Tony Atala, um, Anthony Atala, who was the speaker that you're talking about, Jim, but they, they have been able to engineer very simple organs from human stem cells. So uh, bladders, sphincters, um, you know, they've been able to use in bioreactors. The scaffolding approach is really hard. Um, it's Miro Matrix is a company that's trying to do it. It's, um, it's very difficult to get human stem cells to differentiate them into the right um, tissues to the, then use the scaffolding that you're going to use from a pig organ um, and actually be have it be useful for patients. I, I hope that they're successful in the long run, but my personal opinion is that that technology is years away. Okay, Let, let's get back to the other question that uh, Bill and Ira and Glenda and myself heard at that dinner because I'd love to hear what your opinions are. What would it take uh, for you personally, and would you consider, and under what condition, maybe that's it, under what conditions would you consider an animal organ as part of a transplant? So I'm leaving that open, not just to kidneys and hearts, but any organ. Angel, you need to unmute first. Trying. Okay, there we are. <laughs> Would you? Um, years ago, when Bert was um, first waiting for his liver, and um, you got to remember, you guys know the story. He was 25 years with chronic active liver disease before they even said, you know what, you might need a transplant. Then, when they evaluated for him for the transplant, there were people who said, we don't think he can, you know, he's a, um, a candidate. And of course, we went to see Starzl, and everybody knows who Dr. Starzl is. Dr. Starzl, many years before that, had taken a monkey's liver and put it in a dog, and he was not successful. And he was not successful many times. I see Dave shaking his head. And I, we read all about this, and we talked all about it, and then when it came to Bert not being able for you know, a, an able candidate. Him and I talked about that. When we got to Pittsburgh, we said, would you take a monkey's liver or, wow. a, or a dog's liver or something like that? And he, who had been sick 25 years with chronic active liver disease and was in the hospital 12 to 15 times a year. And our goal was to be hospital free in our life said, Hell yes. <laughs> how many yeah. years has it been again? Tell us how many years since he got his transplant. 1995. Okay. He's so going to be 27. 27 years. And then what? And Dave might be interested in this. When, when I got my transplant, they also gave me the donor's bone marrow. Really? To try to fight off the, the rejection. Wow. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a tolerance approach. 
What? Well, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Storzel and Dr. Chisak has worked with that, and he got um, you know, bone marrow tra- uh, cells, and um, they they did it consistently in trials, and then the year he got it. Well, he got his transplant in May and they had just started that year in January. So it had been a full whoo, four months. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, everybody who got the, um, you know, bone marrow did well with it. And he has, um, he only had one major amount, bout of rejection. That was only one time. I mean, little, little uh, things here and there, but you got it too, Liz. I actually was before that had happened. Yeah. And I not only got CMV mm-hmm. before my trans, no, at, right after my transplant, right. sorry, mm-hmm. but I also had so many rejections that I was put on OKT3 to destroy my T. Oh God, do you remember that? Yeah. So, you know, like they, I think it was within a year or two. Well, I was in 1992. So yeah. within a few years, they were yeah. starting to mm-hmm. put bone marrow in with the, the liver. So right. yeah, right. Exactly. Right. Let me let me go around the horn and just we so we get everybody's feedback on this before we run out of time, and then we'll have more time to go in deep in the discussion. Okay. But the question is, under what conditions would you or would you not accept an animal organ? Don't worry about whether it's a heart or a kidney, and certainly the kidney has a difference because that's not the last opportunity, whereas a heart, there aren't other opportunities. Well, maybe mechanicals, but whatever. So let me, uh, Susan, are you with us? I know you're muted. Would you? And if so, what, under what conditions? Um, yeah, I'm an I'm an unusual set of circumstances. I, I'm a kidney and pancreas. Um, obviously, I, what I needed most was the um, kidney. I was not on dialysis, mm. so I can't feature. Well, it'll get me off of dialysis for X number of years. Uh, so that's not an equation. If I um, were you diabetic, Susan? Yes, I was. I was a juvenile diabetic for over thirty years. I've been taking shots since I was eleven. So yes so, or no? Would you accept the new organ from an animal today? Y- yes, not not flat not flat out my first choice, but yes, right. I would. I would. Ac- I would accept one under circumstances okay barry how about yourself yeah no i i uh, if there were no options uh, or what what's the best option for uh survival and and uh, quality of life would be if the uh, animal uh, uh, uh organ would be the uh, best option i would certainly uh, uh be agreeable to that i mean it, it's sort of uh, like, uh, uh, the, I mean, this, this question about, you know, uh, the pig's heart and things being kosher, right? sort of reminiscent of, uh, made me think of, uh, you know, that, uh, some, some people are, uh, you know, veg- vegetarians and, uh, you know, they, they, they don't, they don't eat meat. So, you know, I, there's, there's some similarities there between, you know, are you willing to, you know, use, uh, c- consume animal, right. uh, products to maintain your your survival your nutrition yeah. uh, so and, you're saying uh, yes you would under those conditions yeah in my in my my case you know if, if that were, were the, uh, the most viable option yes right. I would. gary can i add something about the ve- being a vegetarian go ahead susan it, I, it's a consideration but not because you're eating the donated organ it's a matter of <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, it, it's, it's, you know, know it's, it's, you're, 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 people you're, who are vegetarians are vegetarians because they don't think it's right to be killing animals to eat. So it'd be a matter of killing an animal right. to get an organ. Right. Right. That, 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 I, that's, that yeah. makes sense. Gary? Well, as soon, as soon as the, as soon as the news broke about it, you know, I'm thinking this is crazy. But the more I read about it, how they prepared the heart and all the research, I'd follow the science. And if it was my last resort, I'd say yes. Very interesting. Steve? Same for you. If it it was the last resort, if you're dead ended, in my case, I was on hemodialysis, which was pretty darn dangerous. And I was getting ready to do, you know, um, uh, home dialysis. And it was just 
not a quality of life that I wanted to experience. So, so you if this yes. was my only option, I'd say yes to it. Okay. John Scanelli? I guess it would just depend at the time what the pros and cons are. In other words, do you have a choice? And if you have a choice, what, you know, what are the benefits and what are the uh, negatives? Let's, uh, assu let's assume you're desperate, John. And what we know well, today, I mean, would you say yes or no? Oh, well, yeah. If the doctor says this is your only hope, then, yeah. and he says he recommends it, yeah. That, okay. Uh, Brian? As opposed to going on dialysis? Yes, I would. All right, so you're talking just kidneys, but I'm saying in general, let's say it was a heart. I, I want to make it organ. Uh, more general, sandwich. yeah. I, 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 again, under the certain under the uh, circumstances right. that it would be the best option. Yes. Okay. Sue and Bob. Um, since I was a donor, I didn't have to deal with being right. But if you need one today, let's pay, make you on the patient one, side. Yeah, yes, I would take an animal. How are you, Bob? I definitely would uh, take the animal, and hopefully, uh, if I do pass, that the scientists and the doctors will get more information to make somebody else's life longer. Okay, Michelle. You haven't been the patient, but if you were, would you accept an animal organ? Yes, I would. Marty? I would, but in the back of my mind, I would still be concerned about the longevity of it. Okay. Elizabeth, yes or no? Yes, but I just want to add, you know, when I was in Pittsburgh in 1992, there was not that much known about the longevity from liver transplant, you know, after a liver transplant. So I already feel like I took a risk. So I would definitely take that risk if that were my only choice. And as we saw in the Burden of Genius movie, I mean, Starzl's initial uh, years of liver transplants failed left and right. I mean, people right. said, you got to stop doing this already. You're just killing people. But he was taking people who were desperate. So even in the early stages of any organ transplant, there's a lot of risk and there's a lot of failures leading to the eventual success. So keep that in mind. Bob Goodman, yes or no? Uh, yeah, yes, if I had no other choice. Uh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Glenda and Ira? Glenda? Well, I already said, you know, if if that were my only choice, I'd absolutely. Listen, okay. I grew up on a farm. My father sent four of us to college on pigs. I have no objection to pigs. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I do, however, have a question for David. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm concerned, uh, confused about the retrovirus business because I thought this was a dead end if you couldn't get rid of the retrovirus. And I thought I heard you say they did not get rid of the retrovirus. Yeah, that's correct. So what has been shown is that the retrovirus can invade human cells. Um, this is in laboratory experiments, okay. but they, they haven't definitively shown if you transplant a porcine organ into a human, whether the retrovirus can jump to humans. We are, we are highly convinced that it is the right thing to do to eliminate them because why wouldn't you wanna do that? I mean, um, but what the FDA guidelines on xenotransplantation and they've actually published those. So, I mean, people should realize like the FDA has actually struggled with this and where they've come out is that at the very least, there needs to be an intensive monitoring program for retroviral transmission. Um, we think it's best to eliminate it, but other people, you know, don't have that capability. Hmm. Uh, Ira, yes or no? Uh, it's, it, it's a very, very simple, if there were, if I was confronted with the idea, just talking about kidney, if I was confronted with the idea that I'd have to spend one day on dialysis, I would run to the nearest hospital and pull my kidney off the, my pig kidney off the shelf. With, uh, right. Let, let's go with, it, with hearts too. I, I assume that applies to hearts. Correct. Absolutely correct. Okay. And uh, yeah, no question. 
I, I for myself, I'm going to answer this and I'm going to turn it back to Bill and he can answer it and he can take this meeting wherever he wants to take it from this point on. I know David was going to have to leave us early. So if you disappear, David, we certainly understand. Uh, again, I think the time uh, to consider this, if it's done today, it's a lot easier than five or 10 years ago. Okay. And so I would, no choice but to die or a pig's heart. And I would do the same thing that our friend David Bennett did down in Maryland. Give it to me. Uh, Bill, turning it over to you, what would you say? Yes or no? And under what condition? Well, listen, if I could go hog wild on the bicycle, oh, why not? No. Sign me oh. up. <laughs> you know, providing that I don't pig out when it comes to mealtime. <laughs> I mean, I'm all for it. You spent all that while building those two. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I have to go, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Thank you, for David, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Oh, David, for a wonderful really appreciate thank, you, thank you, David. See what you, thank you did, David. Bill? You chased them away. Oh, no, that was that was not Bill. That was not Bill, but uh, really lovely to speak with all of you. Thank you so much for Elizabeth. taking the time. Uh, Jim, thanks for the invitation. We do record this, and I will send you a link to it once we publish it. Okay. That's Thank you Thank again, you so David. Much, everyone. That was perfect. Elizabeth, uh, you had your hand up. Good evening. Bye, everyone. Bye. Good night. I did not have my hand up. I was clapping. For okay, him. I see. Right. I, nope. I am going to have to leave you in a minute or so because we have not eaten din dinner and we're going to eat dinner. So. Are you so having pork you chops? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Having bagels and and all the smoked so that's what we're having. And smoked bacon, what? No, <laughs> I guess well, listen, you don't get to talk very much, do you, Bill? <laughs> we don't let him talk very much. Oh, well, listen, yeah. this was certainly a timely topic uh, tonight, and uh, I Thank did have you. a speaker lined up, and Jim and I kind of thought, you know, this has really been in the news. And, you know, what threw me is that last year, the end of last year, right, Bob Montgomery, uh, I follow him very closely. And then once that came up on the radar with that uh, kidney uh, transplant, right? That uh, was just like, wow. And then all of a sudden, sneak attack, right? They're, they're, they jump to a heart. I mean, this is against all the rules, right? And then to see, again, another, not one kidney, but two kidneys, right? So that really got news. And it was like, oh, this is a first. And I'm like going, no, it isn't. Bob Montgomery did it in NYU, you know, a month ago. What are you talking? Uh, this is new. Well, it was new in the fact that they didn't implant one, but they implanted two. And if you read it, the one did well, the other one, not so well. So I'm not so sure what that and was. That was a that. cadaver, right? For the this, this is going to be live here to stay. Both were brain dead um, recipients. Yeah. Yeah. Right? This, this is going to be here to stay. Yeah. It's going to improve Absolutely. over time. And, you know, at the outset of David's comments, he said the, the reason he jumped to this company and, and, and among other things, is that it's it, this is going to uh, open up more donate more donation more more options for for people and yeah. and that's the key and I don't I don't see this this technology and and the development of of meds and everything else and and the changing of of uh, you know retrofitting the the cells and things like that I don't see that stopping I think I think we're going to be on a trajectory there. Yeah. And to Barry's point, I've been following this too, where they're taking organs and they're scrubbing them free of DNA, right? The organ is completely white and then injecting stem cells. And how fascinating would it be that we don't have to worry about immunosuppression anymore? Well, right? you know, I, I, there, there's something came out that there's, uh, they're now uh, producing chicken that uh, is uh, from the, the genetic material from chickens without actually having a chicken. That, that's that's uh, uh, you know uh, alive. So the, the, the genetic uh, 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 progress that's been made to create tissue from uh, uh, you know the, the genes of, of any animal is just just incredible. And Barry, with that chicken, is that before the egg? I, I knew he was going <laughs> to say that. <laughs> I think in Israel they're doing it with beef. Um, I read I read some articles about that that they're they're 
growing meat, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. One, one other thought, Bill, before we go, and that is, you know, if you're a company and you're going to develop this technology, which would seem to be similar between hearts and kidneys, I mean, the same issues are around, I would think you'd focus on the kidneys because you'd have more uh, buyers for your product, if you will, because 80% of the transplant waiting patients are kidneys. Mm -hmm. And yet, for mm -hmm. some reason or other, David's company is focused on kidneys. He that there is, uh, they're also doing some work on livers and kidneys also, uh, I'm sorry, livers and uh, hearts, but not, that's not their focus to get a product out first, okay? Mm -hmm. But for the other company to focus on hearts, I mean, yeah, there's a couple thousand of them waiting out there, but at the same time, wouldn't you go with the bigger product uh, opportunity? But anyway, glad they do what they do. Bill, that back to you, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's just really finding the right fit, right? Being at yeah. the right place at the right time and the opportunity, you know, for Mr. Bennett, right? He mm -hmm. just basically was at the right place at the right time and someone really stepped into that opportunity. Yeah. So, and for the how, is that, how is he doing? Well, based on what David was telling us and, you know, Jim and I were talking, no news is good news, I guess, because we would see that in the headlines, right? If something were to happen with them, he's going to be in the hospital. Would know if there was anything out there to know, I mean, they're right down there in Baltimore. Yeah. And, you know, there's two months they expect him to be in the hospital and then release him. So wow. you know, there's another controversy around this. I just I didn't wasn't aware of this, but it just finally came out. This guy was in prison for stabbing somebody, but released after six years back in late 90s, was it? And so there are those who are criticizing uh, the medical community for making that decision. The medical community is saying, hey, we do it on medical issues. We don't do it on character or you know, those other during issues. During time. That's, so there's a lot more that's, been, that's, that's been a well-decided body of law for many, many years about prisoners getting, or do they deserve it and all that. And there is um that that's been well decided in supreme court cases for many 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 years now there's there. been lots uh, of prisoners who have donated organs yeah that's right so. So.